Thank you for joining us. Over the many years of producing this show, we get into a broad variety of subjects and viewpoints. From timeless holiday specials to current issues, including politics, and the continuous hope for peaceful solutions anywhere in the world, everywhere, of course. We also invite prominent leaders in education and culture and in the arts and business also. Our guest today is Mr. George Zimmer, who will share his thoughts on business success and his other interests following these messages. Joining us now from California is George Zimmer, the founder and chief executive officer of the Men's Warehouse. George, it's a real pleasure to have you on the show. How are you doing, sir? I'm wonderful. Thank you for inviting me. My pleasure. You're the founder of a public company and you've been at the helm of this company for over 38 years and you're still just as involved as ever. What are the things that continue to motivate you to come into work every day? Well, it's really the people. Uh, as you say, I, I've been here for a long time. Actually, I, I just uh, changed my official position. I'm now the executive chairman. I've uh, uh, made another gentleman our CEO, uh, creating a, a transition while I'm still very active. Uh, what I love is uh, uh, coming to work and, and, and being around the men and women that I've worked with for decades, most of the people uh, in my senior executive group have been with the company for uh, 20 years or so. So we're more than just uh, colleagues, we're, we're friends. Well, that's certainly very impressive. Let me ask you what you regard as the most important ingredients that you attribute your company's success to. I think that uh, the secret to our success is that from the very beginning we decided that we wanted management and labor to collaborate, not, not to become adversarial. And we wanted people to enjoy coming to work. In fact, we, we use the word fun. And we want people to become friends. So friendship and fun are, are very important in, in Men's Warehouse. And the result of this is that most of our workforce, certainly not every individual, we have 16 or 17,000 people today, but most people enjoy their jobs sufficiently so that when they're working with our customers, because in the retail business, uh, we have millions of customers, not any individual large customers. So it really uh, uh, boils down to how thousands of employees interact with millions of customers. Do they create a positive, meaningful shopping experience that encourages people to uh, shop again. Would you say the lessons you've learned are also applicable to non-retail businesses? You know, I, I really believe that it is. Um, I would go so far as to say that the secret to organizational success, and I now include nonprofits, for-profits, any organization is for there to be trust between the members of the organization. Uh, we think we've created that uh, at Men's Warehouse between the company and its employees and customers, uh, not to mention the vendors and communities in which we do business as well as our shareholders. But it really is all about trust. Interesting. So many things are all about trust. I'd like to ask you about your philanthropic endeavors. I understand you're involved with quite a number of these. Please tell our audience about the causes and the organizations that you support. Well, let me first say that uh, I'm probably not significantly more active than others, but because I'm on television, it appears that way. Uh, the causes that are, are, are most dear to me are the Oakland Zoo, uh, of which I've, I've been a member uh, of, of our foundation board there for 25 years, and I just feel very strongly about uh, animal rights, that uh, if we're going to have zoos, 
We need to provide a quality experience for the animals, and uh, I'd like to see uh, a better, uh, 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 a more kosher-like uh, uh, use uh, of, of slaughter in, in the animal world for our food. Uh, my other passion is, is a nonprofit called the Institute of Noetic Sciences. The word noetic means knowledge that does not come through the five primary senses. So a short way of understanding noetic would be intuition. And uh, uh, I believe and actually have built my, my life and my business on the, the notion that consciousness is uh, equal to as powerful as matter. And so that spirit and matter are equal partners in, in our universe. And I try to live my life uh, under a paradigm which says, I'll see something when I believe it more than I'll believe something when I see it. I share your thoughts on animal rights and the cruelty and exploitation animals and the environment are subjected to. And these words come to my mind. Until he extends his circle of compassion to include all living things, man will not himself find peace. Albert Schweitzer said that, and I respect you also for your down-to-earth philosophy and ideas. I understand you're interested in many other things also, including education, of course. So please tell our audience why you believe in today's world there's a greater need than ever for lifelong learning. Well, I, I, I don't know that it's uh, uh, necessary for me to explain why it's necessary for lifelong learning. I would suggest that people who are not learning throughout their life are, are the ones that, that need to come up with an explanation. Uh, learning is fun to begin with. So uh, learning is, uh, a lifelong learning is, is simply a way of, of uh, making one's life more, more interesting and more enjoyable. Uh, when I speak at uh, high schools or universities, I try to uh, warn all the students that although they're probably uh, uh, up to here now with reading, that when they get out of school, reading just begins. And that if they continue to read as adults, they will read far more, much more after they leave school than they do during school. There is some recent research that I just want to share with your audience because it's so simple and so powerful. When you are trying to work with children, whether it's as a parent or as a teacher, and you are reviewing material, if you review math where all of the review is just math, you will get a certain level of retention. If you mix into your review another subject such as social studies so that you ask a child a math question and then a social studies question, possibly a science question, the retention goes up by 30 percent and this has been documented because it's, it's pretty easy to do the experiments. And I just think that it's amazing that we haven't materially changed our public education system for over a hundred years. And uh, there is evidence th that I just cited that would significantly enhance our kids' uh, educational experiences. And since there is such a, in a wealth of, of information in our uh, world today, uh, it just seems like a much better use of one's time than watching the 24-hour news cycles or the endless sports uh, routines that uh, are what, or reality television shows that are what constitute entertainment for, for most people. Now you're hitting another hot button with me because I'm quite critical of a lot of the TV programming the public has shown on television worldwide. So much of it is rubbish and on the other hand, there are also some redeeming features, a lot of excellent educational programs on the Learning Channel, the Science Channel, PBS and National Geographic, for example. 
Yet there's so much meaningless trash out there, along with negative content that in my opinion is harmful and undermines values and society in general. What are your thoughts on this? Oh, I couldn't agree more. It's, uh, it's ab absolutely embarrassing. Uh, reality TV is uh, really a reflection on the uh, society, on American society today, how shallow and, and superficial and uh, uh, celebrity-oriented it, it has become. Well, all we can do is try and apply our good ideas in this world and try and make a difference. I'd like to change subjects again and ask you about healthcare. George, I recently interviewed the author of a powerful new book entitled Pharmocracy, which states that misguided medical regulations are bankrupting America. Please share some of your views on that subject. Well, I think that there's uh, always some of that in our uh, bureaucratic society. Uh, and, and the health issue is a, uh, an enormous problem economically in America. As we all know, our, our spending here is double that of other uh, similar countries. Uh, I, I really believe, uh, although I'm a Democrat uh, politically, that uh, this is not a, a, a partisan issue that this is going to require bipartisan support. Uh, the Democrats are going to have to come uh, to terms with the trial lawyers and allow for meaningful tort reform in the medical system. Uh, only after meaningful tort reform can we ask our doctors and our hospitals to uh, stop worrying about being sued and start providing the type of medical care that they think professionally is warranted. I think that that would reduce the amount of unnecessary testing and save tens of billions of dollars. And I also think, and, and this may be controversial, I, I don't know uh, uh, where the Jewish position on this would be, but I don't believe we're gonna be able to afford as a society for the masses to uh, resuscitate people who are in hospitals with terminal diseases uh, who have their heart stop. Uh, I'm going to uh, say something here that people may find cold-hearted, but I think if you're north of 80 years old and you've got terminal liver cancer and your heart stops in the hospital, we ought to let you uh, move on. Interesting thought. I'd say that must be a controversial topic in many people's minds. I'd like to change subjects again, if you don't mind, George, and ask you how you see the challenges facing the United States of America at this time in history. Well, the biggest challenge uh, in America is, is actually the same uh, challenge in the rest of the first world, which is that now that technology has become integrated in society, there are not enough jobs for everybody in the world. There are not enough jobs for everybody in the United States. So I've thought about this and I have a, a, a simple uh, suggestion to make, which is we, we go to a four day on, three day off system in, in the United States uh, without a significant reduction in compensation. Uh, number one, this will reduce our energy consumption uh, dramatically. Uh, number two, it will give uh, society and families additional time to help mentor our children, particularly our boys, uh, into adulthood. Uh, and, and number three, I think it will, will, will help strengthen uh, the fabric of our society and, and, and refocus our efforts uh, away from just work and into the other things that make life worth living. So uh, that's really one of my uh, uh, big ideas right now, four-day work weeks. I think that's an excellent idea. I'd like us to continue with these subjects, but we have to take a break for a moment for these commercial messages, and we'll continue in just a moment.